So let's pray. Father, we thank you this evening. We praise you, Lord, for your amazing grace to us. <clears throat> we ask now that as we consider this uh, passage of Scripture that uh, Pastor Kelly is doing this series on as far as going through the book of Joshua, a really a tremendous book, a book of transition. Father, we pray that you'll help us as we look at this particular passage tonight. Give us wisdom and insight into it. Be with Pastor Kelly and Peggy this week as this is a, a difficult week for them. Bless uh, the Breath of Air concert this Saturday evening. We pray, Father, for the moving of the hand of the Spirit of God. Uh, this is a very a godly, uh, spiritual uh, presentation that's going to be had. Uh, we just thank you, Father, that uh, we could have this opportunity to experience uh, in our in this church uh, this wonderful opportunity. Thank you, Father, for how you provided it and bless for Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. Uh, I don't know if some of you may know Roberta Powell. She uh, is uh, the wife of the pastor, uh, Tom Powell's brother, who is uh, Mitch Powell out in Tacoma, Washington. Uh, they lost a son a couple of years ago in a tragic car accident. He was 21. Uh, then there's Sue Newell Keller, who was also another lady that we've known for probably 35 years. Uh, her son, at 23 years old, was in an accident and was taken also. Those two ladies are part of this uh, Breath of Air choir that's coming. And uh, the leader of this uh, choir, Bayard, his name is Bayard Du Bois. He has uh, encouraged all of his people to listen to, to go online and watch the, the video of, of what happened uh, three years ago with, with Anna Grace. And they've all been so broken by it. And then this past weekend, one of the ladies that was in, that's in the, in the choir, uh, had an aneurysm and died. She's been with them for 10 years loved by everybody so this is the first time they've sung since that incident so you know, believe in God this will be quite a time of uh, God moving this weekend so please be praying and if you can come we're going to start it at 6 and it's about a 2 hour total performance a little intermission Pastor Kelly's going to present a video and so forth but it will be something where we can see maybe the hand of God move in this community uh, for to touch people for Christ. So that's something to think about. Okay, this evening I want you to, if you would turn with me just to Joshua 4 briefly this tonight. Uh, let's I'll give you a little setting that's happened here. Pastor Kelly had spoken on chapter 3 last week, and uh, we had uh, the waters parted uh, of, the ri of the River Jordan. Very similar to what had happened uh, probably about uh, well, many years before when they had crossed into at least 40 years, 40 or 41 years previous to this, when uh, they had actually crossed, uh, the, the Israelites had crossed the Red, Red Sea uh, with, with Moses leading them. And it's interesting how the Holy Spirit wants to make a parallel here because there's a, there's a preparation of three different things that the Spirit of God in this chapter kind of presents. And as we look here, we find that uh, the waters have parted. Uh, now, I've been to the, the River Jordan with my wife, and we have seen the unbelievable flow of the water. At it, it, certain times of the year, it overflows its banks. It is a major contributory to the Sea of Galilee, and it is, it is a very powerful river. And so the waters stopped on one coming down and it drained down the other side and here was a path on dry land or well land to go across for them to walk across in the Jordan River similar to the Red Sea and there was a reason for this and we find here that uh, this uh, this year happens to be uh, 14 uh, 1407 BC some of the scholars uh, believe that and, and as best as that. About one year before this, though, the preparation had started to happen for a number of things to happen. God had taken Moses 
and he told him in, in Numbers 17, he says, look, I want you to take Joshua. I want you to have him uh, be brought before the people. This is a year before this incident right here is happening. And he says, I'm going to have, promote Joshua in front of the eyes of the people. And I want you to bring the high priest, Eliezer, and I want you to have him uh, lay hands on him. And before the people, I want to begin to set aside Joshua for the task of what I'm going to do. I'm going to, you're going to come home with me. We're, we're, at the, we're coming close to the, to the uh, plain that's outside of, uh, across the, the plain from the river from the land, there's the River Jordan, and then there's the, the plain. And so this happens in all the people. If we look here in, uh, in Numbers chapter 27, it says, and You shall invest in him with some of your authority, in verse 20, that all the congregation of the people of Israel may obey. Now this is an interesting thing because uh, it says in verse 23, And he laid hands on him and commissioned him, as the Lord directed through Moses. So here's God telling Moses, you lay hands on Joshua. And he said, I want you to set him aside. Now, as we look through the book of Deuteronomy, which actually was a, probably a, an extended period of time, but probably no more than a year, uh, Moses is sitting on the plains as he's not going to go into the land because of God saying, because he struck the stone. And here's the whole of, whole of the Israel, and possibly some scholars believe it could have been as much as a million and a half people. Now, I don't know if you've seen some of the, the uh, ball games and you've looked at some of these stadiums where they have 100,000 people. You look and say, wow, unbelievable. If you look at Joel Osteen on, on television, you see that incredible stadium that's just packed out. Can you imagine about 10 times that many people all standing around waiting? And Moses speaks to them, and that's what the book of Deuteronomy is actually like the second law is what it says. Actually, it's a reiteration of all kind of a basic history of what happened to Israel. And Moses is informing a brand new generation of people. For 40 years, they wandered in the wilderness. And if you remember back in Numbers 11, because of the disobedience of the 10 spies influencing all the people, God said, okay, Moses, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just start over. And Moses says, you can't do that. You've got to be gracious. You've got to be patient with these people. After all, you don't want Pharaoh and all of Egypt mocking you for what you've done. And so God says, okay, then what I'm going to tell you to do, what I'm going to do then is this. All those that are 20 years older and younger, they will be the ones that will enter into the promised land. And those that are the remaining ones will die in the wilderness. And so that's what's happened. Now you got a whole brand new generation, and Moses is speaking to them. And within a year's period of time, he's preparing them for when he moves along, when God takes them away, and when, when they start to come to the place where God's going to part the waters of, the, of the, uh, the River Jordan and let them go across. And so we find that as they're doing this, in chapter 3, as Pastor Kelly had spoken about last week, very interesting thing happens here. There's three things. Number one is the introduction of, of Joshua. Uh, you know, when you, nobody really wants to follow and obey anybody unless they've had some kind of investment or there's something in their hearts that wa warrants a response and leadership over their lives. This is a crucial thing. That's why you have a lot of big churches when, when somebody... Uh, one, a, fa a, a very effective pastor moves on or the church changes hands because of something that's happened. Sometimes there's a lot of adjustment that's needed and people do not adjust very well to new leadership. And so God wants to use Joshua here. And this is interesting because it kind of applies to our lives too. When God works in our lives with changes, there are certain things that we have to remember. Well, we're going to get very disoriented. We don't know from one day to another how long any of us will be here. But it's important that we're very careful in how we perceive, how we look at the future. Here are all these young people that now are in their, maybe in their 50s or 60s, maybe 70 years old. 
And here's Joshua, who was one of the original 12 spies, very old, and they're there to, they've heard from God through Moses, the one they respected, and now they're supposed to follow Joshua into this unknown land that they've only heard about. They don't know about it. They've just heard what their parents said. They know what's the story been told, what Moses has promised, a land filled with milk and honey, but they also know there's a multitude of enemies there that they're going to have to face. And so Joshua is in a position, number one, to become the leader. And so he's, in a very spiritual way, he says, this is what I want, want you to do now. And as we look at the, the, the testimony of what's happened here, we find that the priests are uh, initially here, it says in, in verse uh, 8, it says in, after the rivers had been cut off and they had stopped in verse 7, it says the children of Israel uh, did so. Uh, they, they, uh, they placed a set of stones, uh, leaders of each one of the tribes, of 12 stones in the midst of the river. That's dry. They put in the stones. They placed a bunch of stones. Uh, they get, and they also are told to carry a set of stones of 12 stones over to the other side of the river and make a pile there and monument to them. Now the reason for this is that they want, Joshua says really, you want this is what I want you to do. When you make this change, you see the miraculous event here. The waters are held up. We're going to move across this river on dry ground. I want you to remember the provision of God right now. God in your midst, God who's now, after all these 40 years, the deliverance from Egypt, all the things, you've got the manna, you've got the water, all the things that have been provided, the guidance and everything. Now we're coming, we're going to cross this river. We do not want you to forget the provision and miracle of God. When you got saved, and when we came into an understanding of who Jesus is, what was the, uh, those are things that God really wants us to remember. Memory is a wonderful thing when it's a memory of the right things. To remember the faithfulness of God. Hey, million and a half people, God got us this far. Now we're going to see a miracle like your, your parents had but died in the wilderness. They saw the great move across the river, the, the great Red Sea. And now God's going to prove to you that Joshua, this man, is going to lead you. But we're going to show you the faithfulness of God. I don't have many rivers and many seas part today. But boy, we know what God has done in our past to deliver us from the sea of sin, the background we've come from. God said, I want you to remember that. Secondly, and the, the, as the, this has happened, the priests stand in the middle of the river with the ark on their, on their shoulders. Nothing's going to happen. Going to, they're going to stand there for maybe hours, getting a million and a half people across. It's unbelievable how many people that would take and how and quickly they went across. And they're to stand there and wait. And then they establish the, the pile of stones. And uh, they're there. And, and, and God, is, God is saying, now remember this. This is where you walked. And this stone pile over here for all your children, remember. What does that signify? So when your little ones, it says in the next couple, three verses here, when your little ones say, uh, Mom, Dad, what's the purpose of those stones? You tell them. It's relating to the faithfulness of God. And you see, that's why we have Sunday school. That's why we have church. That's why we come as often as we can to to remember and to be taught and to be encouraged in the word of God and to remember the things that have happened. Now in this building here tonight, probably there's been hundreds and hundreds of people over the years that have come to know Christ. This is kind of a, 
sacred ground in a sense. We don't worship a building and we don't see it any more significant because of our, it's, God is in our hearts. But the point is, we remember the things that God's done faithfully in our lives. Because why? They're going to go into an unbelievable land. Everywhere they go, they're going to see demonic hosts. They're going to see demons. They're going to see uh, idols. They're going to witness all kinds of things. And lo and behold, they're going to need to remember the things that happened. See, I don't know what's going to happen to America in the next few years. We could see some terrifying things that worse than ever. But we have to remember the faithfulness of God. The fact that God said, you know what? I'm faithful tonight in comfortable America where we're safe. We've got... But what about if we now have going in the streets all kinds of crazy things happening? What if the economy goes and all different kinds of things? Are you going to be, are you going to be stable with that? Or are we going to... Are we going to get just really upset and moved and perplexed because we forget the faithfulness of God? So the, 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 the priests are to stand there in the middle. I mean, I don't know how long it was. They had this thing on their shoulder, the Ark of the Covenant. What was in the Ark of the Covenant? What was in the Ark of the Covenant was, was the, the Ten Commandments. It was a place where the Word of God was standing true. God had stand true. The Law of Moses was there. And God says, this is, this is significant. I want you to remember this. I want you to get the scene of it, million and a half people. Look at, look at what's happening there. There's the river. Water's backed up. There they are. That's my deliverance. And then it says that as the time went on here, the priest is the third thing. God says, I've, I've raised up amongst you, I got Joshua as the leader, but amongst you there are people who we have to remember had a great influence on our lives spiritually to bring us a knowledge of God. Now think about it, they didn't have the Bible then. Very few people could read. It was mostly oral tradition. They didn't pull out their Bible like this tonight and read the passage and get encouraged. They had to hear from the priests. God says, I've made you now, as Revelation 1, verse 5 and 6 speaks about, I've made you priests, you and me priests tonight, because the Holy Spirit's placed his temple right in us tonight. This is where the seat of communication goes on with God. We have the word of God written down. The scriptures have been hidden in our hearts. They're, they're unbelievable. We have them clearly to be able to understand them. But we also still need people to help us and guide us. That's why it's important that we recognize the, the need for uh, leaders in our lives. Uh, you know, Pastor Kelly has been such a good pastor, uh, just so faithful to preach the word. You know, he hasn't, he hasn't deviated from, from the truth of the scriptures. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of people in this country. I, I've been on the phone this past week with a couple of churches that they're they're really struggling with somebody who's, who's just plain crazy about the Word of God. They don't believe the Word of God. They, they question it. They're li listening to all kinds of, of different trends and, and thoughts that are happening. But see, this pulpit tonight is a place where I can remember and I can learn from the pastors that are giving leaders but also to complement our priesthood before Christ, you see? So it says that as the, as the uh, priests finally, if everybody had passed over and they'd got the set of stones that were on the top there, on the, on the side of the bank, and they had a set of stones in the water, 12 there, 12 there, it says then the priests began to move the ark. And it says the minute that all of the priests' feet were standing on dry ground. It says the river Jordan came flowing down again, flooded over the banks, returned to normalcy again. They had crossed over into the promised land. Now, those three things tonight are the reason why you and I are on this earth tonight. 
we are in the place where God is preparing us for the greatest promised land of all. We've come from the wilderness of sin. We've listened carefully. God has had, a, had, a, had somebody, a Moses, then a Joshua. To, to, God has been faithful to guide us. And he's preparing us for the land that we're going we're to take on. And remember last week also, I just thought this was very interesting, that the Reubenites and the Gadites, the, the tribe of the Reubenite, of the Reuben and the, and the tribe of Gad, they're all in battle gear. They're all set. They come across too. They got their swords and shields and everything. You know why? Because Moses had talked to them back, if you remember, and he told them, you know, they said, look, Moses, why don't you just take the rest, all the other ten tribes, just go across the river. We'll just stay over here in the land, and it's good here. We can run, have our flocks and everything, and, and we'll still be friends, and we'll wave to you across the river, and, you know, we'll, we'll have the... Moses says, no, you won't. You either come with us, stand with us, be a part of us, and win the land. Or, you, you know, you're, God is not going to bless you to have those, that land on, the, on that side of the of River Jordan. So Re Reuben and Gad agreed to it, and they said, oh, okay, we'll do that. And so they went, and they went into battle. And you remember, the, the, this is what's amazing. You see, when people are united together, when they have the presence of God in their midst, when they obey the leaders that God has given them, and when they act before God in, in activity with the priesthood that each one of us are, what happens? They go into the land, and it says, you remember what Rahab says, we'll get that story later on, but she says, you know what, we know who you are. We've heard about you. We know what happened the Red Sea. We heard all the stories about you, and everybody's fearful of you. The God of Israel is the one we're, we're concerned about. And then remember the Gibeonites. They heard about it. They said, you know what? If we don't do something, we're going to wind up slaughtered by the Israelites if we don't make a pact with them. And they went in. They deceived Joshua. He didn't listen to God. He says he didn't listen to God. He didn't listen to God. Even the leader didn't do that. And lo and behold, the Gibeonites wound up being protected as a heathen group of people by the Israelites for the rest of their lives. They couldn't touch them, whatever. And when Saul did, tried to kill a bunch of them, God was angry with David and told David, you have to make it right with them. You have to deal with the, the sons of Saul or else you're not going to have the blessing on the land. <laughs> so God honors unity. So out of this this evening in this passage, and I just kind of breezed through it because there's so much here. You could spend a series just on this passage alone, but it's amazing how God said, you know what? I've done so many mir miraculous things in your life. Now, you come through the wilderness in many ways. Some of you were just captivated and addicted to different things. I delivered you. I gave you hope in your heart. I want you to remember what God has done. I preached a message in Wiscasset many years ago, first one that I was asked to speak. And it was on, I just, it just burned in my heart because I had thought of how much God had done for us. But remember when Noah landed and when he came on the, it says, and God remembered Noah. <laughs> God wants us to remember him because of what he's done. Father, we thank you this evening for your love and your grace to us. Thank you for your faithfulness to us. We want to remember the things. When Joshua came over there, it was important for the next generation to know. Oh, yeah, we remember that. God says, well, here's an example of my faithfulness to Joshua and to you now. I'm going to part the Jordan River. I want you to remember by placing stones. I want this to be a memorial. So when your kids ask you, well, what does that mean? You can say, oh, that's a testimony of the faithfulness of God. Lord, tonight that means so much to us because really our lives we don't know. We can't, we can't discern the next day what's going to happen. 
We don't know what tomorrow may bring. I was talking to my 95-year-old father this morning. Uh, probably in the next few months, he's going to go home to be with you. And Lord, uh, it's hard for him. He doesn't see always clearly the promises that you've made to him. And Father, we just thank you. We just help you that he'll remember that you have always been faithful, that you will keep your promises. Israel, God keeps his promises. You're back in the land. You came out of this, the country of bondage in Egypt, delivered you through unbelievable things, and now you've just crossed the river Jordan, and I fulfill my promise to have you return. Father, thank you, and we just praise you, Lord. Bless this weekend. Bless Pastor Kelly again, Father. Thank you so much for each one that contributes here. Father, we just want to be found faithful as we have a testimony of Jesus Christ in this community. We thank you for all the outreaches with Andre, with the chaplaincy, and so many here that just do different things that touch people's lives. Uh, we're, we're, not, we're, we're, keeping, we're keeping the promises in our frontal lobe so that we remember the faithfulness of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.